thanks everyone for uh, for joining us. Uh, it is an incredible honor for me to introduce uh, uh, the speaker of today's session of the Space Force Single Cell Seminar Series. Uh, and before I get to the speaker, I just want to say a few words about this series that is put together by um, Peter Adams, Brian James, and Jeffrey Wall, uh, three uh, professors across uh, Salk and uh, Sanford um, Burnham Prebis. And um, together with them, I'm, I've been uh, lucky enough to uh, participate in this effort to uh, recruit people from all over the country and, and hopefully the world who are uh, leaders in the field of single cell uh, transcriptomics. And um, the speaker of today is uh, Jeffrey Moffitt, uh, who has a, an appointment at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Microbiology, and also at um, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and um, Jeffrey started uh, as a PhD at UC Berkeley. He was interested in um, mechanical biology and uh, in particular, the ability to use mechanical force to manipulate proteins. And this is where I came to know Jeff. Uh, as a uh, young and impressionable graduate student, I was uh, a big fan of his uh, graduate's uh, work. And in fact, um, Jeff's advisor during that time, Carlos Bustamante, he was a big pioneer in the field of single molecule biology. And every time Carlos would give a talk somewhere, people kept saying that, you know, out of all of these incredible studies, the part about viral packaging motors, that was really sort of, that was the, the epitome of what we can do with, a, with this field. It turns out that Jeff was uh, the main driving force behind, um, be, behind that work, the effort to actually characterize using mechanical force, how a viral, viral packaging motor took DNA and then packaged it mechanically into uh, the viral capsid. And so, um, yeah, if you have some spare time, please look at Jeff's uh, PhD work. It's absolutely beautiful. And it shows you how you can use a really high, um, uh, high resolution force uh, spectroscopy to figure out the mechanical inner workings of, of these biological motors. And then after his uh, very successful PhD, Jeff went on to do a postdoc as a Helen Hay Whitney postdoctoral fellow with uh, Xiaowei Zhuang at Harvard University. And at Harvard, um, he switched fields a little bit. So still single molecule biology, but now um, making it massively throughput and trying to put it in the context of, of living things and then namely um, cells and tissues. Uh, and so Jeff was one of the leading characters in the development of the method MRFISH, which is um, uh, a single cell a spatial transcriptome profiling method that allows you to see the transcriptome in, in different cells in the context of a, an intact uh, tissue. And so while, while Jeff was both part of the initial effort to, to create this method, he was uh, also absolutely instrumental in um, making it so that this method is not just a curiosity for a couple of labs that have these specialized capabilities, but he's made um, enormous efforts to make it user-friendly and, um, and, and really robust and, 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 um, and practical, you know, which is something that is over and overlooked when, when uh, scientific labs develop new methods. And so um, as a new faculty member, I'm very curious to see what's gonna come out of his lab. He's been, how many years have you been a, a professor now, Jeff? I don't know if we count COVID time, but a little over two years now. Okay, so in, in COVID years, it's like half a year. So <laughs> very excited to see what's going to happen. And um, I hope you will also uh, talk about, a bit about how Murfish can help um, our labs here and, and other labs around the world uh, get a fuller picture of what's going on on the transcriptional level in, in different tissues. Uh, and so before I let you go, I, I, I just want to end on a, on a personal note that when, when Jeff was in the lab, he shared uh, so I did my postdoc in the same lab as Jeff, and, and he shared an office with another postdoc, which was a very tiny office. So it was always surprising to me that they would get along being in this uh, very, very small square footage. Uh, and that was until I realized that they had completely non-overlapping schedules. So Jeff would come in in the morning at around 5 a.m. and then work until the early hours of the evening. Uh, and then when he would leave, the other postdoc would enter and then work through the night. So I think they effectively spent uh, their entire postdocs without 
having to fight too much over, over the limited space. Um, and so given that Jeff is a morning person, I think it's, uh, it's, it's really great to see you here um, awake at this uh, late hour in Boston. So without further ado, um, Jeff, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paula. That was an extremely generous and nice uh, introduction. And as Paula alluded to, he and I had uh, really, to my great fortune, had a lot of overlap while we were at Xiaowei's laboratory. So uh, my only regret in coming here today is that we can't do it in person and we can't catch up more because I would love to catch up with you and see how you're building up here. So, so everybody, I have to say, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be here today, even though as Paul have said, it's way past my bedtime apparently, but I'm gonna do my best to keep the energy high and, and to stay awake. And I wanted to say a few thank yous both to, to Paula for the invitation, but also to Peter and Brian and Jeff for putting together what is really an exciting group of talks in this, this uh, single cell Space Force um, symposium. So I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this talk uh, series. So what I'm gonna do today is tell you uh, a little about a, a technology that I co-developed as a postdoc in Xiaowei's lab that, Paul have alluded to. It's a technology that we call multiplexed error robust fluorescence in situ hybridization or MRFish for short. And in a nutshell, this is a single molecule imaging technology that allows us to not only image molecules, but identify them at the scale of hundreds or thousands or now tens of thousands of different mRNAs simultaneously within individual cells. And what's so exciting about this ability is it means that we can now do spatially resolved single cell transcriptomic techniques. So now I'm going to introduce you to the basic concepts of MRFish. And then I'll dive deep on a published story that I think is still perhaps the best illustration of the potential for this technology for defining and mapping cell types within intact tissues. And then finally, I'm gonna give you just a hint of some of the emerging stories that are coming out of my lab. It's all unpublished work. We're very excited about it, but as you'll see, early stages still. Before I get into this though, I just want to acknowledge, oh, sorry. Um, and oh, one more thing uh, for questions, please type your questions in the chat window. And um, if it's something urgent, I will interrupt Jeff and read it out loud. And if it can wait until after the talk, we will take the questions then. But please feel free to write your questions in the chat window at any time. All right. It's a great point, Paula. And if anything's unclear, please, uh, uh, double exclamation points, bring it to Paula's attention. I'm happy to stop and clarify anything. I, I really want to make this so that everyone can understand why we're so excited about this technology. So before I get into the details though, I wanna just disclose that I'm a co-founder and a stakeholder and a scientific advisor to a brand new startup company, VisGen, that is aiming to commercialize this technology. Though nothing that VisGen has produced as products or services were involved in any of the work that I'll present here today. So I, I thought I would start by giving you some motivation for why one would want a spatially resolved approach to single cell transcriptomics. Now, perhaps that's unneeded or unnecessary for uh, a talk series called Space Force, but bear with me nonetheless. And I thought I would do this by sharing with you a story from when I was young. So when I was young, I, I really loved to do auto mechanics with my father. And the answer, the reason why was that this was really the best way to understand how these complex machines, cars would work. And so with that in mind, you can understand why when one day we went out to our Ford Ranger, we didn't have BMWs, we had Ford Ranger trucks, but we turned a key over and out the tailpipe poured this horrible white smoke. And I was thrilled because white smoke means that you're burning oil. If you're burning oil, it means you have a crack in the head gasket. And there's only one way to fix that, which is to pull the engine out and disassemble it. And we did exactly that. We disassembled the whole engine. And we had it in all its parts on the floor of our garage. And I had this sense that I truly understood how this remarkable machine worked because I could see all of its individual pieces and I could understand and catalog them individually. But that understanding was really only fleeting because once we'd repaired the gasket, we had to put all these pieces back together and I realized I didn't remember how they fit together. And so the point I wanna make here is that disassembling complex systems is an extraordinarily powerful way to understand how they work, but you have to know how those pieces fit together. And this is very relevant because we are living through an era of disassembly in biology powered by this remarkable suite of technologies called single cell RNA sequencing, we can now take any complex biological system and disassociate them into their individual parts, cells, capture individual cells, extract from those cells RNAs, and then quantify at the transcriptome scale, the expression of those RNAs within individual cells. 
those profiles allow now us now allow us really for the first time to define cell types and states with a degree of thoroughness that was just not possible before. And because we're defining them based on the very genes that give rise to their function, provide deep functional insights in the behavior of these cells. So this suite of tools has given us really a comprehensive way to define the parts of these systems. But we need to know how those parts fit together. And when you dissociate cells from tissues and you extract RNAs from cells, you lose important spatial insight. And that insight really comes in two forms. The first is captured very beautifully by this image here on the left. These nine panels are all slices taken from the Allen Brain Atlas. There are a slice of cortex, and in each one, color indicates the expression of a specific marker RNA. So I hope you can see here that we've defined different populations of cells based on the expression of these RNAs. Single cell dissociated methods would have had no problem telling us that those different cell types were present, but would not have been able to tell us that they were organized in this beautiful layered organization that we know is essential to cortical function. So tissues are not amorphous bags of cells. We need to know how they're structured to understand how they function. But there's another type of spatial context as well, and it's captured by this image, which I absolutely love. This is a single crawling fibroblast cell. It's crawling from the lower left to the upper right of this individual pane. And in color, we've marked the internal concentration of the beta actin mRNA. So what I think you can clearly see here is that this RNA is not just randomly and uniformly distributed throughout the cytosol. It's actually highly enriched specifically at regions where the cell needs beta actin RNA. And we now know that this type of intracellular RNA organization is actually very widespread and serves as a very powerful form of post-transcriptional regulation in a wide variety of biological processes. So for processes like this, knowing how many copies of an RNA are present in the cell is not gonna be sufficient. We also need to know where those RNAs are found. And so what we realize is that we need technologies that can capture all the benefits of single cell transcriptomic techniques, but while preserving these essential aspects of spatial context. And so that's what we set out to do in my postdoc was to develop a spatially resolved approach to single cell transcriptomics. And today I'm gonna to break my talk really into two sections with a small coda at the end. The first, we're gonna focus entirely on the basic concepts of Murfish. What is this technology? How we've, have we implemented it? How does it perform? And then in the second part of my talk, I'm gonna dive more deeply into a specific application of this technology, the use of it to define and map cell types in a portion of the mouse brain. So Murfish is based upon a very well-established and powerful technique known as single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH. In that approach, you take your sample of interest, you fix it, and then you permeabilize the membranes and you hybridize to it a set of fluorescently labeled DNA oligonucleotide probes. Each of those probes is complementary to a different region of the RNA of interest and base pairing binds those probes to each and every copy of that RNA in your sample. This concentrates a large number of fluorophores at each molecular copy, such that if you image the sample with an epifluorescence microscope, you get a bright fluorescent spot at each molecule. So if you want to determine the expression of this RNA, you just simply count the number of spots. And because these are fixed samples that you're imaging, you immediately know how that RNA is organized within cells and within the sample as a whole. So our goal in developing Murfish was to take this very powerful technique and push it to the transcriptome scale by massively multiplexing it. And here's the basic way in which we do this. We start by assigning to every RNA that we're interested in studying a unique binary barcode. And then we read out those barcodes in the following way. We start by staining our sample with relatively conventional single molecule fish protocols, but with one very important twist. Instead of targeting a single RNA, we target every RNA that has a one in the first bit assigned to it. We'll get a pattern of fluorescent spots like this. We will image the sample, and then we will go on by removing this signal and restaining exactly the same sample, this time targeting every RNA that has a one in the second bit of its barcode. Get a different pattern of fluorescent spots, we'll image, remove, and repeat with one round of single molecule fish for every bit in this barcode. We can then take a look at the individual fluorescent on off pattern for each of these RNAs across this stack of images that defines the binary barcode and thus the identity of this RNA. And the power of this technique is that every time you add one more round of single molecule fish, you add a bit, which doubles the number of barcodes you have. So the number of RNAs you can identify with this technology explodes, it grows geometrically with the number of images you collect. One of the other things that we realized very early on in the development of Murfish and that we introduced into this field was the notion that as this barcode grows in length, the chances that you may accidentally misread an RNA, an RNA is not bright enough to call it as a bright spot or a one, that's flipping a one to a zero, 
or perhaps there's some fluorescent junk in your sample that you think is an RNA when it's not. That's calling a zero as a one. This chance increases the longer the barcodes. And thus, what happens is you corrupt one RNA into another. And so to address this problem, we leveraged ideas that had been uh, developed 50 years ago in the context of information theory, namely error-robust encoding and, and correcting encoding schemes, approaches that can actually detect when individual bits are corrupted and correct them. I'm happy to go into details if people have questions, but these are the two critical concepts that underlie the way in which MRFish functions. So let's take a look at some actual MRFish data. This is a human osteosarcoma cell line on the left here. You can see three cells from a, a culture of the cell line. And the bright fluorescent dots represent individual RNA molecules after the first round of MRFish staining. If we zoom in on one small portion of one of these cells, we can see a molecule. And because it's present in this round, it has one in its first bar, uh, bit. We then remove this signal, restain the sample, and you'll see that this RNA is no longer fluorescent. That gives us a zero in the second bit. We then stain again, the RNA is back, it gives us a one in the third bit. And I think you get the idea. In this measurement, we're gonna do this 13 more times to build up a stack of 16 images, all of the same sample. And you can see that this RNA is present in the first, the third, the eighth, and the 13th image, defining its binary barcode that identifies it. We have exactly this type of measurement for each of the 140 different RNAs we targeted in this experiment, allowing us to reconstruct an image like this. Here, every marker is a single RNA molecule, and the color is the identity of that RNA. And so I think you can see the richness of these data. They're naturally digital. We have an exact copy number per cell, and they reveal both the spatial organization of RNAs within cells and within the sample as a whole. So in this essence, we've been able to optically barcode and reveal the identity of individual RNAs. Now, I thought I'd say a little bit more about how we actually implement this technology. So in standard single molecule fish, you label your RNAs with fluorescently labeled oligonucleotide probes. But in MRFish, we use unlabeled probes that we call encoding probes. They have two important regions. The first is the region of complementarity to the RNA of interest. We could call that the targeting sequence because base pairing of that region targets that encoding probe to the specific RNA. Flanking this are barcode regions. These are the physical embodiment of our binary barcodes. And the way in which we encode these barcodes is that we define a unique 20 nucleotide binding site for each of our bits. Those are called readout sequences. If an encoding probe has a readout sequence associated with the bit, then it has a one in that bit. If it doesn't have that readout sequence, then it has a zero. And the reason why we do this is that it turns out for reasons the field still does not fully understand. Hybridizing probes to cellular RNAs is a slow process. It typically takes 12 to 36 hours. So if we're talking about a 16 rounds of imaging and staining, that would be an experiment that would take three weeks. However, when we want to read out the presence of these readout sequences, we simply introduce a fluorescently labeled readout probe. And it turns out that hybridizing of DNA oligos to these DNA overhangs is extremely rapid. Here you can see that occupancy of an individual site is a function of time. In minutes with nanomolar probes, these spikes, uh, sites are fully occupied. So an experiment that would have taken three weeks now can be done in hours. To remove this signal, we actually link these fluorophores to our probes via disulfide bonds, allowing us to use a gentle reducing agent to cleave the fluorophores from our entire sample and wash them away simultaneously when we're done imaging. And then I just want to note that we can also use multicolor fluorescence to read out multiple bits in individual rounds as well. So now to give you a sense of how MRFish performs, we made these measurements of 140 RNAs across thousands of cells, averaged them together to get an average copy number per cell. That's what each dot represents for a different gene. MRFish measurements on the y-axis. To benchmark this technique, we then compared to an independent measure of bulk of RNA abundance, in this case, bulk RNA sequencing. That's what's on the x-axis. And I think you can see that these two independent techniques produce measurements that correlate very strongly, telling us that MRFish can measure relative RNA abundances very accurately. Now to turn to absolute abundance, we turn to the gold standard for single cell copy number measurements. In that case, it turns out that's single molecule fish. We made these measurements for 15 different genes, compared them against MRFish, and produced the data that you see here, where again, MRFish is on the uh, y-axis, single uh, molecule fish on the x. Once again, these two technologies correlate beautifully. But there are a few other things that I want you to notice here. First, these techniques agree across the full dynamic range of single molecule fish, telling us that MRFish can measure RNA abundances that span at least three orders of magnitude. They agree even down to the lowest abundance level probed, which is less than one RNA copy per cell, meaning that we can faithfully report even a single RNA copy in an individual cell. 
And then finally, you see that these markers largely fall along the dash to quality line, telling us that if there were 100 copies of an RNA in a cell, Murfish would measure almost all of those RNAs. And this is actually important to note, because what I've told you is that we've been able to increase the multiplexing of single molecule fish, in this case, by over two orders of magnitude, but with almost no cost in the performance of this technique. We maintain the same large dynamic range, single molecule tens sensitivity, and high detection efficiency. Jeff, uh, we have a question. Please. Um, by Charmaine Sokol. Uh, she's wondering, uh, does this work for RNAs with secondary, tertiary, et cetera, structures? It's a very astute question. So one of the reasons why single molecule fish is so robust is that we put in many tens of probes to an RNA covering different regions. And we do not need all of those probes to bind to produce a clear fluorescent signal. So there is an inherent redundancy in the binding of our probes. And that allows us to largely ignore questions about whether secondary structure or protein inclusion might in fact inhibit the binding of these probes. Uh, it is, I think, still a very much an open question in the field of uh, in situ hybridization as to what role these other structures might play in the relative uh, probability of individual probe binding. But so the, but the um, hybridization conditions probably disfavor some of, of these secondary structures as well, is that correct? That is absolutely true, but then there's a competition effect afterwards. In other words, if you have a complementary sequence, if you melt it during hybridization, and then relax the hybridization conditions to do the rest of your experiment, it's now there essentially indefinitely to compete with your probe. So there, there are some interesting things that I think are still not fully understood about the basic molecular physics of uh, hybridization. Cool. Okay, but, um, uh, one, one more question by Zibo Ma. Will the sensitivity remain the same when you increase the number of probes to uh, nearly full transcriptome? That is a beautiful question. And let me just continue on to my next slide to give you an answer to that. So one of the advantages of this technology is that if we want to increase the multiplexing, we just increase the number of images that we collect. And the multiplexing grows extremely quickly. So I want to share with you some results that were done by colleagues of mine in Xiaowei's laboratory that really illustrate the, the uh, tremendous multiplexing you can get out of this technique. So what you see here is a human osteosarcoma cell line with individual RNAs labeled, but this time it's 10,000 different RNAs. The challenge here to extending Murfish from a couple hundred genes to 10,000 was not anything about multiplexing. In this case, they used a 69-bit barcode. The challenge was the density of RNAs. You need to be able to resolve individual molecular signals to make sense of these barcodes. And as you increase the number of RNAs you target, the total number of fluorescent molecules increases until the point spread function from these molecules starts to overlap and you can't disentangle it. And the solution in this case was to leverage a combination of Murfish with a very brilliant technique that came out of uh, Ed Boyden's lab at MIT called expansion microscopy. In that approach, you anchor your RNA of interest to a gel. That gel is charged and you remove the screening salt such that the gel now swells isotropically, pulling your molecules apart and separating them so that they can be resolved some combination of expansion microscopy and leveraging some very powerful things about binary barcodes allowed the Zhuang lab to uh, resolve 10,000 different RNAs. And when they perform our fish across this, they again found that the measurements they observed here correlate very beautifully with bulk sequencing and preserve largely the high performance that we observe for even lower degrees of multiplexing. So with Murfish, we showed right away that you could do 100 or 1,000 genes, but now it's very straight, or it's been demonstrated that you can extend this technique to almost whole transcriptome. Again, I think whole transcriptome is doable. It's just a matter of adding additional bits to your barcode. So with this ability to perform massively multiplex gene expression measurements, there are actually a very wide range of biological questions that we can now tackle. And I wanna give you just a taste or an overview of this diversity of questions that we've now started to demonstrate with this technology. So first, because it's such a sensitive technique that captures almost all of the molecules that are present, that means that we can actually leverage natural variation in gene expression from one cell to another, even identical cells, to extract information about the gene regulatory process. For example, if two genes share common regulatory motifs, natural variation in the activity and abundance of those motifs from cell to cell should propagate through the regulatory network, leading to co-variation in gene expression. And we've shown that that's exactly what we can observe 
and we can use covariation and gene expression, very small covariations, only possible to measure with such a sensitive technique, to back extract regulatory networks. But we don't just know how many copies of an RNA are found within each cell. We know exactly where each and every one of those copies was found, which means that we can immediately map the internal organization of the transcriptome with individual cells in a wide variety of organisms. The fact that we have gene expression measurements not only allow us to define properties of cells, they can tell us things about cell state, like cell cycle, some of which can be extracted, in fact, from the location of those RNAs within a cell. And then I wanted to point out that we're not constrained to our ability to measure natural mRNAs, we can actually also identify synthetic RNAs. And those synthetic RNAs can be used as barcode in a wide variety of biotechnology applications. For example, you can create pooled libraries for screening where every cell carries a different genetic perturbation and a unique merfishable barcode. Now with microscopy, you can determine the phenotype carried by each cell and then the barcode expresses and thus the genotype. So in a single measurement, you can get both genotype and phenotype from a single microscopy measurement. But the application I want to focus on for the rest of my talk is perhaps one of the most exciting applications in Murfish, which is the ability to take intact biological samples, measure gene expression across sizes of those samples, discover and define cell types, and map their organization. And so the specific example I'm going to tell you about now is a portion of the mouse brain known as the preoptic region of the hypothalamus. This is work that I did as a postdoc in collaboration with Catherine Delock. Yeah, Paula, please. Yeah, before you go on, we have a technical question on uh, the correlation between um, the Murfish data and the sequencing data. So by Gerald Powell, who was wondering, in your data, there seems to be biases in the low abundance regime between sequencing and Murfish. Do you know why this does occur? I imagine the sources of noise are different. And then he also asks, what is the estimated error rate based on your Hamming distance slash rate and error correction, uh, utilization. Yeah, you, you get the point. I do. Both excellent questions. So first of all, very astute in noticing this slight deviation from a perfect uh, linear correlation at low abundance. That's because Murfish has a finite false positive rate. There are fluorescent signatures that do look like RNAs, but that are not. And one of the advantages of this high multiplexing is that we can take some of our multiplexing capacity and leave those barcodes unassigned to RNAs. Thus, we have a direct measure of false positive rates in each and every Murfish measurement we do. This slight deviation from correlation at the lowest abundance RNAs actually can be linked to this false positive rate. And it's a little difficult to see in some of these plots, but this deviation occurs in an RNA copy number less than one copy per cell. So it means that where you would worry about the accuracy of these measurements is if you were looking at expression of one per se 20 or 30 cells. But if you see an RNA in a cell, you can really trust that that's a real RNA. Uh, and then the rates of this, it turn out for very technical reasons, are linked to Hamming distance and the, the abundance of uh, barcodes that are more or further apart from one another. But more often than not, these are not generated by flipping one barcode to another, but actual physical collision events that two RNAs are close enough that they generate a fluorescent signature at their overlap that kind of looks like something entirely different. Um, but again, these are low uh, error rate events. So uh, Jeff Wall has a, a question, or actually a couple of questions. Uh, They're more practical in nature. So how does Murfish compare to other methods of spatial transcriptomics, such as SeekFish Plus? Also, what would the cost be for a full transcriptome analysis? And how do you do cell segmentation in complex tissues? Great. Um, I'll come to the cell question. segmentation. Uh, question a little bit later, and that's one um, one of the small vignettes I'll show you. It, that's a, that is a, it depends on the tissue, but that can be a challenging problem, and we think we have good solutions in collaboration with uh, Peter Karchenko's lab here at HMS. Um, yeah, so, so I think that one of the exciting things about the field right now is that there are a wide variety of growing technologies for spatial omics. Um, some of them have larger than cellular resolution, some have subcellular resolution, some are based on spatial capture, some are based on imaging. SeekFish is a technology that is very similar to Murfish. In its original uh, implementation, it was a colorometric based barcode where you were staining individual RNAs each round. And uh, it was developed basically in parallel to what we did with Murfish. As the years have gone on, uh, Long Kai and his team with SeekFish have continued to push this technology. That's what brought them to SeekFish Plus. 
And a lot of the things that we've introduced along the way, like the concept of binary barcodes, the way in which we can create these um, individual encoding probes, the two-step labeling that happens in encoding probes, those ideas have kind of propagated throughout the field and have accumulated in technologies like SeekFish. So that in practice now, I think the distinctions are uh, relatively modest between these two techniques. And the, the last question was, what, what would the cost be for a full transcriptome analysis? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, Murfish has an upfront cost associated with creating the library of probes that you target to RNAs. So if you're targeting a whole transcriptome, you might have 100,000 or more unique oligonucleotide encoding probes. We've developed low cost weights to make those. I'd be happy to go into greater depth later uh, in the talk if people are interested. Um, but at the scale of a whole transcriptome, there is an upfront cost of $30,000, $40,000. After you've paid that cost, an individual run itself is not particularly expensive in raw reagents. Uh, it's just that you have this upfront cost. Now, that being said, I hope I will convince you as we go through that I actually think that while whole transcriptome will have its application space, targeted measurements are actually going to be the standard for a long time. And in many ways are actually a, a more cost of effective and powerful way to get at the biology that you want to get at. Great. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about mapping the preoptic region of the hypothalamus. So what you see here on the left is a coronal and a sagittal section of the adult mouse brain. And the black box in the dashed line is a portion of the hypothalamus called the preoptic region. Now this is an interesting region of the brain because it has circuits that are responsible for the control of a wide variety of unlearned instinctive behaviors. For example, how a mouse responds to simple stimuli like hunger or thirst or fever, or actually even more complex stimuli, stimuli that trigger complex social behaviors like aggression, mating, or parenting. These all have circuits that in part are found within the preoptic region. And because these are unlearned behaviors, then it stands to reason that they are controlled by genetically defined circuits that are comprised of molecularly distinct neurons. And so we wanted to ask a very simple question. What are the type of neurons that are found within this brain region? How are they spatially organized? And then perhaps more interestingly, how are they functionally organized? How does a finite number of neuronal types give rise to this huge array of hypothalamic functions? We felt like Murfish was actually perfectly suited to these questions, but because this was the first time that we were gonna benchmark Murfish in its ability to atlas in a tissue, we wanted to have an independent data set. So the first thing we did was single cell RNA sequencing. We dissected out the preoptic region from multiple mice, dissociated those regions into individual cells, captured 31,000 cells using the chromium platform and sequenced them. That produced the data that you see here. Genes are rows, cells are columns, color is expression of those genes in those cells. We analyzed these data with the now standard statistical toolbox, unsupervised clustering, and we visualized these data with TSNE, producing the plot that you see here. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but each marker is a cell and it's placed within this 2D space so it falls next to cells expressing the same sets of genes. Colors indicate individual clusters of cells. So what we can see in this data is that we find all of the cell types you would expect, or at least I should say most of the cell types you would expect in this region of the brain. Now in red and yellow are excitatory and inhibitory neurons. You can see that there's a lot of substructure here. So we subject them to a second round of unsupervised clustering. And in total, we found about 66 different neurons with single cell sequencing in this brain. So now we have a benchmark data set against which we can compare Murfish. So we decided to perform Murfish of 155 genes. We divided those genes up into the following categories to create our panel. First, we included classically defined markers of major cell types. So inhibitory cell markers, excitatory markers, oligodendrocyte markers, and so forth. Then we mined our single cell sequencing data to help us find the best markers for neuronal types. That included about the rest, the, the, the next uh, third of the panel. And then finally, we didn't want to just define these neurons. We actually wanted to learn something about their biology. So it turns out that neuropeptide and hormone signaling is important in this region of the brain. So we included a comprehensive panel of neuropeptides and neuropeptide and hormone receptors. And this latter group, the receptors, is actually a very important category, as you'll see, because receptors are often very functionally relevant even when expressed at very low levels, a couple RNA copies per cell. And while single cell sequencing has many strengths, one of its potential weaknesses is it captures a relatively modest fraction of the RNAs that are present in a cell. So it can struggle to extract information from these functionally relevant but lowly expressed genes. By contrast with Murfish, we have single molecule sensitivity. So we were optimistic that we could characterize this important category much better. 
So we dissected out two millimeter by two millimeter by 600 micron blocks, sectioned those into 10 micron thick sections and arrayed every fifth section on cover slips. Then we perform our fish. What you see here on the left is a single 200 by 200 micron field of view, where each white dot represents a single RNA molecule imaged anywhere within the 10 micron thickness of this slice. We included co-stains such as a total polyadenylated RNA stain and DAPI, which allowed us to use automated segmentation routines, namely seated watershed approaches to define the somal boundaries that you see here. And now with Murfish, we can color these RNAs based on their identity to produce this image. And I always find this image so striking because you can immediately see the unique molecular fingerprints that define different cell types in these colors. So you have cells that predominantly express red RNAs, or green RNAs, or purple RNAs. Now to give you a sense of the scale with which we can do this imaging, let's zoom back out to a single two by two millimeter slice. That white box is the field of view that I just showed you. And now we can't comprehend 155 color palettes. So I'm just gonna simplify this data by plotting eight RNAs in eight colors. Let's walk through their distributions to give you a sense of the richness across these large tissue areas. So you can see that each of these RNAs defines their own unique cell type as well as defining anatomical features across this tissue type. Now, because we have a boundary for each cell and we know where every RNA was found, we know how many copies of each RNA were found within each cell. And we can use those expression profiles with the exact same statistical toolbox developed for single cell sequencing, unsupervised clustering and TSNE visualization. That's what produced the plot here on the left. But underscoring the throughput of Murfish, rather than having 30,000 cells, here we had almost half a million cells. And now we can ask an essential question. Murfish characterized only 155 genes. Was that enough to discover the cell types in this region of the brain? And what you can see here from this T-SNE is that it was more than enough. We found all the cell types we expected. And in fact, we found cell types that we largely did not find in sequencing. This small little pink population at the bottom are ependymal cells. We think they were selectively lost in our single cell dissociation. We clearly see these here. Now we can ask a second question, which is equally interesting. We've discovered and defined these cell types with two very different technologies for measuring RNA abundance. One that uses next generation sequencing and one that uses direct in situ RNA identification. They both identified cell types, but are the expression profiles of those cell types in quantitative agreement? So we computed the average expression profile and performed a pairwise Pearson correlation analysis. Murfish are rows, sequencing our columns, and this strong diagonal of Pearson correlation coefficients all close to one tell us that these two different technologies produce expression profiles in quantitative agreement, which is a beautiful cross-validation of both methods. So we can define cell types with Murfish, but of course the advantage is that we did so without dissociating any of these cells out of the tissue. So we get an atlas of this tissue basically for free. That's what you see here. So individual black boxes are single two by two millimeter slices, we have 12 of them collected from a single mouse arrayed anterior to posterior, left to right. Each of the gray boundaries here you see are one of the roughly 60,000 cells imaged in this single experiment in this single mouse. Now we can color these cells based on their identity as determined by Murfish. So this is the distribution of our inhibitory neurons. You can see largely distributed throughout the bottom two thirds of our slice, though depleted in a structures of the top third. Here are the distributions of excitatory neurons, which very interestingly have their own unique spatial distribution which has important implications for excitatory inhibitory balance in this region of the brain. Let's look at some non-neuronal cells. These are myelinating oligodendrocytes, which you can see are distributed throughout the neuron-rich region, but are highly enriched in these regions at the top of these slices depleted in neurons. That's very reassuring because those features are a known structure called the anterior commissure. That's a nerve fiber tract, which is exactly the type of structure where you'd expect to see neuronal soma depleted and myelinating oligodendrocytes enriched. We can take a look at precursors to oligodendrocytes, which very interestingly have their own unique spatial distribution, which indicates there's a spatial component to the maturation of these cells. And then we find that microglia, astrocytes, endothelial cells all distribute throughout the brain uniformly. Pericytes, which are contractile cells involved in blood flow, we can see these structures moving through the brain. And here's this population of cells that were selectively lost in sequencing. This is one of my favorite distributions. These are the ependymal cells. You can see that they form a beautiful single cell layer flanking a structure known as the third ventricle. These are ciliated cells that drive the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. That's exactly what's found within the third ventricle. So this is exactly where these cells are known to be found. We can put back all these colors to reconstruct an atlas of all of these major cell classes in a single mouse brain. There's a lot we've learned here, but I'm gonna uh, jump over that just for the sake of time. So now we took our inhibitory and excitatory neurons identified with Murfish and subject them to a second round of clustering. We found 70 different types of neurons in this data. So it's a remarkable diversity of neurons in such a small portion of the brain. Once again, we asked, are these similar to the neurons we found with sequencing? 
We did a pairwise Pearson correlation analysis. Once again, we got a nice diagonal. But here we wanted to go one step further and not just say, do these two data sets agree, but rather to find a correspondence between neuronal types in one data set and the other. So we did the absolute simplest thing you could imagine. We pulled out the largest correlation coefficients that were statistically distinguishable. That leaves us with the non-zero entries in this matrix you see here, which is our best guess of a neuronal type and sequencing, how it matches to that in Murfish. 80% of the neuronal types we discover in one data set have a corresponding type in the other, which is again, another beautiful cross-validation. But I want you to notice something. This correspondence is not always one-to-one. -one. You can find instances where one data set actually has a neuronal type that corresponds pretty much equally well to multiple neuronal types in the other data set which what we believe is happening is that one technology is better able to subdivide similar neuronal types compared to the other. Well, that's not surprising. One of these techniques measured 150 genes, the other measured the whole transcriptome. But what might be surprising, it is that it's Murfish that is better able to divide these sub, uh, neuronal types rather than sequencing. And so we wanted to understand why that might be. So we dug into a few examples. So what you see here is a measure of the gene expression of a handful of marker genes on the uh, rows for Murfish neuronal types on the left and sequencing on the right. Now we've matched these up so that they correspond, so that the colors of these columns correspond to corresponding types between the two technologies. So you'll see that E8 corresponds with little e3. What I want you to do is to go into the light orange. There you see two neuronal types in Murfish, capital I14 and I16, that actually correspond to a single neuronal type in sequencing, little i16. You can see they actually have very much similar expression profiles. So we wanted to understand why is it that Murfish is better able to subdivide this neuronal type? So we asked, what are the marker genes that distinguish I14 from I16? That's what we see here. And to our surprise, the majority of them are receptors, functionally relevant, lowly expressed genes. Once we knew that these types were there, we could train machine learning algorithms to go and look for them in the single cell data. And sure enough, we found them with the right expression profile. But as a further validation, we could say if these are truly marker genes that distinguish these two different neuronal types, we would expect they're not expressed in the same neuronal type. So we did a correlation analysis between those genes, between the two types observed in Murfish. That's the correlation matrix you see at the top. And you see banks of genes that are correlated with each other, but anti-correlated with the other bank. That's exactly what you expect for markers of two different neuronal type. Then we can take the single cell sequencing cluster that was not subdivided and ask, does it contain exactly the same statistical structure? That's what you see on the lower right, and you can see that it does. So even though sequencing one was unable to divide these neuronal types, the structure was still there in the data, providing a nice validation. And I'll show you in a slide, we've actually functionally validated this distinction between I14 and I16. So Murfish is able to discover neuronal types because of its sensitivity. That's something important I want you to take away from this talk. So we can also map out the organization of these neurons, and for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into the really interesting hypothalamus biology that we learned here. I'll just again show you an atlas. 12 slices are read left to right. Gray are all cells, red, green, blue are the, all of the instances of three different inhibitory neuronal types. You can see bilaterally symmetric distributions reproduced across replicant animals. And we can just look at an array of different neuronal types. What I want you to take from this is that for our 70 different neuronal types, remarkably, we find 70 different spatial patterns. So what that tells you is the underlying organizational principles of the hypothalamus, that any individual hypothalamic region is not defined by a unique set of neuronal types, but rather the intersection of individual neuronal types, which again, I think has important implications for the circuits in this region of the brain. Now, there's one other thing that we can learn from space. So for any of you that have done single cell RNA sequencing, you know that even for all cells of a single type, there's natural variation in gene expression you don't see the same copy numbers of all the genes within those cells. And that could be true biological variability, or it could be technical noise. You don't know. But with Murfish, we can ask, is there a spatial com component to that variation? So again, what you see here on the left is a single slice. Gray are all cells, and red are every instance of a single neuronal type. We're going to pull out those neurons and decompose their gene expression with principal component analysis, and now replot those neurons in space, but coloring them based on the strength of their principal components. So here are the first principal components. Red is high, blue is uh, low. Here's the second principal component. And what I want you to take from this is that a large portion of the variation we observe in gene expression within neurons, neurons of the same type is actually cued by their location in the brain. So what this tells us is that there are subtle but perhaps functionally relevant gene expression variations that happen based on the location of these cells. What are the meaning? We don't know yet, 
But the fact that we can measure this means that this is a question that we can directly tackle. So we've defined these neuronal types, we've mapped them out. Can we now say something about their function? And so we had, did a very simple experiment. We took a female mouse, we added a pup to its cage. It turns out that mouse will actually retrieve the pup and bring it back to its nest and care for it. That's the instinctive parenting response. And then after that heartwarming display, we will sacrifice that mother and we will perform more fish in its brain. But we'll include one gene in our panel, the gene CFOS. Now, CFOS isn't designed to distinguish neuronal types. Rather, it's what's known as an immediate early gene that is rapidly transcribed in response to neuronal activity. So the expression of CFOS is now a proxy for neurons that were active during this parental response. So now what we can do is we can plot out our 70 neuronal types and ask how many of those were CFOS positive. That's what these bars are. And I still find this absolutely amazing. In this complex parental behavior, there is one and only one neuronal type in virgin female mice that is statistically active in this behavior. Now we can do a control experiment. We take a male mouse, we add a pup to its cage. It will actually attack and kill that pup. We perform this measurement and this parental neuron, which is present in that mouse's brain, no longer is expressing CFOS, but a set of neurons, presumably that underlie this aggressive response are now active. Now you can do something that I find even more interesting. You can take a male mouse three weeks after sexual experience. You put a pup in its cage, it will care for that pup. And it turns out that that parental neuron is now active in that mouse's brain. But interestingly, so are the aggressive neurons. So the simple model is that this mouse has a native aggressive response that is overridden by a state dependent switch in the parental circuit. And I think you get the point here. We can now treat these mice with a battery of behaviors or a stimuli that trigger hypothalamic circuits and functionally annotate each of these neural types that we have. And we've done that for a variety of these. So what, we've, what I've shown you is that we can use Murfish to create a molecularly defined atlas of cell types, in this case, in the hypothalamus, that in the hypothalamus, we found a remarkable diversity of neuronal types, really pretty remarkable given the small size of the brain region that we characterized. And when you couple that with the fact that individual neural types are selectively active in distinct hypothalamic behaviors, it favors a model in which the wide variety of hypothalamic functions are supported by a similarly large number of unique neuronal types. We mapped out these neurons and that spatial organization not only revealed the organizational principles in the hypothalamus, as I mentioned, it has some important implications for circuits in this region of the brain. And this leads us to an important question. We've now established Murphy's ability to atlas in, in the mouse brain. Can it be done in other tissues? And that's where I'm gonna leave you with just a small vignette of some of the unpublished work that's coming out of my lab. We've been working specifically to apply Murfish in a variety of tissues, but with a focus on the microbiome host interface. And what I'll tell you is that we have been successful in applying this technique in a broad range of di different tissue types across a range of organisms. But I wanna just dive deeply on one specific system, the mouse gut. So it turns out that much of what we learned for the brain did not actually port over to the mouse gut in terms of sample preparation. And we had two critical challenges, actually. The first was that the brain is a very low endogenous RNA tissue, as we've come to appreciate. And so we had to develop new protocols to preserve RNA during our sectioning. Uh, and in fact, I want to typically highlight a postdoc in my lab, Paulo Kadnu, and a graduate student, Rosalind Chu, who worked extremely hard to get us these protocols. And that brought us to the, the protocols that can give us data like this. This is a single slice of the mouse colon. I'm plotting out the spatial distribution of eight different RNAs. We can again ask, does this data validate against independent techniques? So in this measurement, we measured 330 genes, Murfish copy numbers across thousands of cells on the y-axis, bulk RNA sequencing on the x. And you can see that these two data sets correlate very nicely down to a very low abundance range where we lose this correlation due to this false positive rate in Murfish has already came up. And so this validates that we can do Murfish in the mouse gut. I want to give you a sense of the spatial distribution that we see here. There's a richness to these data. So let's zoom in on this small portion of the epithelia, and we can walk through the spatial distribution of a handful of individual genes. And so you can see that these genes are defining the different anatomical features, the epithelial layer, different gradients along the epithelial layer, the stem cell niche, the subepithelial layer and the fibroblasts, the uh, muscular layer as well. And then we can also see within this tissue lymphatic patches as well, and there's a tremendous richness to the distribution of RNAs here. So our first challenge was overcoming the high endogenous RNAs activity in the gut, which we now have protocols to do. Our second challenge was alluded to already by a question, which is that unlike the brain, 
the gut is a very cell dense tissue. And you can get a sense of this. Look how densely packed these RNA. You have an epithelial layer where cells are just packed literally right together. Right underneath that, you have a mix of fibroblasts and immune cells. And so we knew that we would need to develop ways to define the boundaries of these cells. And we've taken two approaches to this. The first is to couple immunofluorescence with MRFish, aiming to have cell surface markers that are expressed across all cell types. And we've settled on a protein called the sodium potassium ATPase, which maintains cell polarization in essentially all lineages. What we do is we oligo label antibodies to that sodium potassium ATPase, which now allows us to read out both MRFish signals and the location of this cell surface boundary marker with the same approach of labeling fluorescently labeled readout probes. We've taken a second approach as well. And this is done in collaboration with Peter Karchenko's lab at Harvard Medical School, who's really been leading the charge on that, in particular, a graduate student in his lab, Viktor uh, Petrikov. And so the idea here is that we can use these co-stains to find boundaries of the cell, but individual cells will express their own unique complement of RNAs. So can we leverage those unique neighborhoods to also define these boundaries? And so here you see the uh, immunofluorescence stains that we have. You can see that these are defining cell boundaries. But what you see here in the middle is a slice of the mouse small intestine where we have colored RNAs not based on their identity, but based on their local neighborhood. That immediately reveals the richness of this tissue and individual cell types. And we can draw boundaries based just on that. And what we're, this is a technology now that Peter's lab is calling BASER, which uses RNA distributions itself to define these boundaries. It's really a brilliant idea. And what we've now done is we've coupled this with the immunofluorescence staining to refine and improve our boundaries. And I just wanna show you that with this approach, we can now define in these cellular dense tissues, all of the cell types you would expect to see in this tissue here. So here's a U map of the distribution of the 5,000 cells that I showed you in this fragment of the mouse ileum showing all of the expected cell types, both on the epithelial layer, the immune compartment, and the stromal compartment. They are all marked by the markers you would expect to have them, and you can get a sense of the rich spatial distributions that you see here. So this is a project that is just getting started, and uh, I just wanted to give you a, a taste of the direction in which we're heading, and to show you that MRFish can be applied in a broad range of tissues. So with that, let me just stop by leaving you with a question. What is MRFish? In the end, MRFish is really nothing more than a series of single molecule fish measurements. But in each measurement, instead of targeting a single RNA, we target a subset of all the RNAs that we're interested in studying, such that as we go across a successive round of single molecule fish measurements, RNAs are lit up in different subsets, so that each RNA has its own unique fluorescent on-off pattern that serves as a binary barcode that defines it. And we've now shown that this relatively simple idea can be used to massively multiplex single molecule fish going from hundreds to thousands to now tens of thousands of RNAs. And by leveraging ideas associated with information technology, error robust and correcting encoding schemes, we can increase the multiplexing of single molecule fish while preserving its high performance. So MRFish has high detection efficiency, low detection limit, and large dynamic range. And I've only alluded to it, but this is a very high throughput technology. We can quantify tens of millions of RNA copies across tens of thousands of cells in every single measurement at a cost that averages out to be much less than a fraction of a penny per cell, which is pretty competitive for those of you who are spending big dollars to uh, chromium sequence your individual cells. And so what is MRFish? It is a tool for genomic microscopy that allows us to define nanometer scale maps of the expression of the transcriptome within cells and across tissues as a whole. And I hope I've been able to capture a little bit of why we're so excited to have this capability now, because what it means is that not only do we have the tool we need to define the parts of these complex biological systems, but to define how those parts fit together. So with that, I wanna say thank you to all the people that were involved in this work. I presented work that I de uh, did as a postdoc. So I wanna thank my postdoctoral mentor, Xiao Wei, and uh, our collaborator, Catherine Duloc, phenomenal scientists. It was such a pleasure to train and work with the two of them. I wanna thank Stephen, DJ, and Eric who were involved in the hypothalamus work and Hao, Alistair, Stephen, Junji, Guiping, Guiping, Tian, Hazen, and George, who were all instrumental in aspects of uh, development of MRFish. Of course, I wanna thank Palav for helping to make the Zhuang Lab such an amazing place to do science, even though the two of us never had an opportunity to work on a project together yet, I would say. And then I wanna thank the members of my brand new lab. 
I really cannot thank this hardworking team enough. It's amazing that they would take a risk on a new lab like this. And I just, I can't imagine a more talented group of people. Um, postdocs, Brianna, Yanyu, Uli, and Paolo. Paolo's work is uh, some of the work that I highlighted. We have three very talented graduate students, Rosalind, Evan, and Ari. And Rosalind is also one of the core members of our gut team. Rosalind and Paolo here are in this red circle. I wanna thank our collaborators, in particular on the gut, um, uh, Roni Narwoski and a postdoc in his lab, Keisha. And I wanna thank our collaborators on the computational side who've really been driving some amazing computational development, Peter Karchenko and Victor. So with that, I'd be happy to take any more of the questions that have come up uh, in the chat or any more questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jeff, that was absolutely stunning. I, I just can't get enough of these, uh, these beautiful, beautiful uh, pictures that you're showing. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to see that it, things are working out for the gut as well. Uh, so we have quite a lot of uh, questions. I'm gonna try to make, make my way through them. Uh, so starting with Aditya Prasad, he's wondering what is the max number of cells you can image with Murfish? That's an excellent question. There's a trade-off between the number of genes and the number of cells, because as you increase the number of genes, you can start to approach these density limits where it's now important to start expanding your sample. Every time you expand your sample to dilute RNAs, you of course dilute your throughput. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I tend to think that targeted measurements are likely gonna prove to be uh, the workhorse of this technology. Yeah. It depends on the cell density of the tissue, but we can typically image anywhere from 50 to 100,000 cells in a single measurement. And a single measurement across uh, an area that would typically cover that number of cells with all the fluid handling everything is about a day. So you have a, about a day of dedicated microscope time. Great. Archita Agrawal uh, wonders, what is the minimum length and number of probes needed for a specific target? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, there is no hard and fast minimum. But what we found is that as we decrease the number of probes we put in to each RNA, which allows us to target shorter RNAs, we will find that our ability to detect RNAs does start to decrease. So our detection efficiency drops. So we typically do something on the order of 40 or 50 probes, which is an RNA of about 500 nucleotides or larger. We can go shorter. We can go to about 150 or 100, but we start having detection efficiencies that are more modest, 30% or so. Honestly, it's still pretty amazing detection efficiency, but we often really like to have the ability to detect almost everything that's in the sample. Nice. Yeah, Zibo Ma is wondering, uh, oh, actually it's a comment first. Murfish is superior partially due to the higher sensitivity, but this is adversely affected by the probe selection step using uh, single cell RNA-seq data. How do you optimize the selection of lowly expressed genes, especially those expressed near the detection limit in single cell RNA-seq? Yeah, this is a great question, and it is a point that I, I really am glad you brought up. Historically, we leveraged single cell RNA sequencing in order to help us define this Murfish panel, but I didn't have time to discuss this. After we did that, remember there was a second part of the panel that we included only based on biological knowledge and the desire to be comprehensive. So when we looked at these receptors, we included all of them, even if there was no support in the single cell data for those receptors, or even in bulk sequencing because genes that aren't expressed, it doesn't hurt us in multiplexing. Density is the limit, not multiplexing. So we put them all in. And I think that's the future for Murfish. Comprehensive panels of across entire pathways because after we discovered these neuronal types, we could come back and do analyses to say, well, what happens if we just not included the single cell derived genes, but only these genes that were peptides or, or receptors? And the answer is you can define almost all the neuronal types. So I can't guarantee that you would always capture some small division between cell types discovered by some unannotated gene with a targeted method like this. But the way we tend to think about this is we pick pathways that are relevant to our biology. And then if we miss some cell type subdivision that nonetheless expresses the same profile on that pathway, it probably doesn't hurt our biological conclusions. Yeah. All right, uh, Tony Hunter is wondering, uh, did your Murfish analysis of the brain identify R mRNA populations localized at dendritic spines? Most of your signals appear to be in the cell soma. Yeah, that's a great question. So that image came and went very quickly. You're right. The density of RNAs is predominantly in the soma, but half of the molecules we identify are extrasomal. And if you look at these RNAs, these are RNAs that are classically enriched in processes, axons or dendrites. 
So we didn't have the ability to look at individual dendritic spines because we didn't include costains to those, but we can detect those RNAs that are extrasomal. And by including the right costains, the type of analysis you're discussing, I think is a very exciting application space for Murfish. Right. Blair Jia uh, is saying, this transverse view of the colon is super interesting. Are you able to resolve microbiota relative to different parts of the colon? Uh, for instance, a combination of Murfish and 16S specific probes. This is one of the directions my lab is heading in. So maybe next year we can show you some of where we're going on this. Okay, Blair, don't scoop him. All right, or maybe this is healthy competition. Um, uh, all right, let's let's see uh, more. There's a okay. There are some there are more comments than questions. Uh, Michael Nunn uh, is wondering: Have you done any analysis in tumor tissues? That's a great question, Michael. No, my lab is not. Um, We've had collaborations to work in tumors, and I think that this technology could absolutely work in tumors, uh, but we've, we've actually had to turn down those collaborations just for the sake of having a somewhat more narrow focus. Looking at uh, immuno-oncology, looking at the tumor microenvironment, I mean, I think these are amazing questions that this technology is very well suited for. Are there any particular, this is just me wondering, are there, what would you think are the main challenges if you wanted to Port this technology to, to tumor-specific environments? I think there are two challenges that when you move to a new tissue type um, are the challenges you should keep in mind. And the first, honestly, we hadn't really appreciated until I got started in my lab. And that is that tissues will have very different rates of, uh, in, of RNA turnover. And so preparation and preservation approaches can be very different um, based on the tissue. And there are tissues that we're still struggling to actually prep and maintain RNA in them. It's a really interesting thing because these are tissues where people can get good single cell dissociated data, not just nuclei data, but single cell data. So it's something about the cryosectioning we think, but honestly, we're still trying to sort this out. So the first thing as you move into these samples is, is just making sure that you can maintain RNA. Fortunately, that's not too difficult because you can include single molecule fish probes to abundant genes. If you don't get single molecule fish, then you know you've got an RNA integrity problem. Okay. The second challenge that I think will be particularly true in tumors is also this crowded cellular environment. So being able to define what RNAs are grouped together in the same cell um, is challenging by this. And, and one of the things that we're excited about in the gut is that we think we're working on avenues that are likely to apply more broadly elsewhere. So the sodium potassium ATPase in particular is a pan cell type marker. It's expressed on all cell surfaces with perhaps the exception of some very rare lineages. So I think... Uh, I think these type of approaches are likely to apply more broadly, but until we've done it, it there's gonna be optimization, I think, to keep in mind. Okay, we have a question from uh, Peter Adams that maybe you can uh, um, ask yourself because you can unmute yourself. Yeah, will do, thanks, Paula. Beautiful talk, Jeff, it's really, really amazing stuff. Um, yeah, I have so many questions, I guess a lot of them relate to probably kind of things that, you know, I'd. I wonder if you've done, which I'll, I'll save those, but um, I guess I'm thinking, so you mentioned this, this kind of false, um, what appears to be a false positive rate for the, for the low abundance mRNA. So, so I'm wondering, does that affect any particular type of, of gene? For example, you know, low abundance transcription factors maybe, or, or you know, low abundance long non-coding RNAs. Is there, is there a, a particular type of gene that are gonna be challenging to, to assess by this technology? And, and do you think the problems are, so, are solvable? It's a great question, Peter. Let me just drop back to this plot so I can illustrate this. So um, unfortunately this axis is copy number per field of view as opposed to cell. But if we were to convert this into copy number per cell, you would find this level at which we lose correlation with bulk sequencing to be typically on the level of one per 20 to one per 30 cells. So what that means is that if you want to look across an aggregate population of cells and compare that expression to something else or to ask about expression levels across aggregate populations, there is a level where Murfish is gonna be dominated by these false positives. So if you wanna say, can I ask, is this gene expressed at one in a hundred cells in one condition and and one in 30 cells in another. This is not gonna be a great technology for this. But in terms of defining cell types and defining the cells that are actually expressing these genes at functional levels, 
That actually it's very good at because many of these genes that on aggregate are very low is because they're expressed at modest levels in a small number of cell types. And there we have no problem. And so if you were to ask of these genes that are below this detection limit on aggregate, how many of those nonetheless are informative for clustering? The vast majority are. And in those cell types, they are expressed five, six, seven times higher than this limit. So that's why I said, there's actually something when you think about digital data that is, is very essential about getting below an average error of one per cell. If you can get down to one per 10 cells, it means that if you're seeing that one count in that cell, it's likely right. That, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, really beautiful stuff though, Jeff. Thank Great. You. Yeah. Can I, um, I think it might be time to wrap this uh, session. We've already gone uh, over time, but I'm, I'm really happy to see so much activity. I, I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, Jeff visit many times in the future. Uh, at least I'm going to invite him personally to come visit the lab as soon as, uh, as we open up. So you'll have many more um, chances to ask him questions. Um, I just want to end uh, with a question that is more uh, perhaps philosophical in nature. Uh, so Jeff, do you think long term will uh, these spatial methods and maybe even Murfish uh, completely displace um, the sequencing based approaches? Do, we, do you think that um, from a practical point of view, it would make more sense to also get the spatial information and will it eventually not come at the cost of, of the sort of um, uh, the loss in, uh, in coverage that you get from, from uh, sequencing? It's a really great question, Paula. It's, and it's, it's, of course, a dangerous one to put me on the spot in predicting the future. Let me take a bold position. I think that, um, I think that we're going to see that the spatial methods are going to make a big dent in the application space where we're currently using dissociated techniques. Dissociated techniques, especially single cell RNA sequencing, do have some discovery potential. And that, that's real. And I don't think that's going to go away. And they have some ease. There is real value in being able to grind up a tissue and pull out the cells. Sometimes that's a lot easier than mounting a tissue and cryosection it and so forth. So I think that those are real advantages. But for many questions, if you, if you didn't have space, there's a critical aspect of biology that you're missing. And so the spatial techniques have a huge edge up. The other, I would say, that's less well appreciated is the throughput of these technologies. So right now, for us to collect a million cell data set with Murfish is some work, but it's not a crazy amount of work. But to collect a million cells with the single cell technologies now is a tremendous cost investment in time. And so I think as we see the technologies and the infrastructure for Murfish disseminate, there'll be places where you might still dissociate those cells, but you turn around and plate them on a cover slip and then just murfish them um, because of the sensitivity and the cost advantages and the throughput advantages. Right. So if you think of how the cost scales with number of cells, uh, you'll win in the long game. Yeah. And one way to think about this is that, you know, these technologies that are based on next gen sequencing, look, the prices are going to continue, continue to come down. But if you look at some of the innovative ways to create libraries that are extraordinarily expensive, that only cuts the cost by about a factor of two because you still got to pay for the Illumina sequencing. The challenge to adopting Murfish, and that's a non-trivial challenge, right? Is that you've got to build the sequencer in some ways. So it's a microscope that does all of this. So it's all integrated in. So I think that's one of the reasons why this technology can be so competitive in cost. Another way to think about it is that we don't need to know the sequence. We've already genome sequenced these organisms. We can now just target what it hybridizes to. And so I think that there's a sense to which in single cell sequencing, we're, we're actually, it's an overkill. We're, we're doing more, we're getting more information than we actually need. We're by actually sequencing base by base these tags on the end of uh, molecules. So I, I, I will be happy here to go out on a limb because you, you asked me to, to say that I think these technologies are gonna make a dent in, uh, in the application space of the dissociated single cell techniques, but never displace them completely. Well, uh, thank you. I, I, I know that bold positions are the only positions I've, I've known you to have. And <laughs> <laughs> now I'm excited to see where, where this technology goes. And I'm very happy that you're one of the people developing it because for some reason, everything you work with it seems to just uh, turn out functional in the end. So, so I'm, I'm very lucky 
I think we're all very lucky to have you uh, lead some of this development. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Jeff, for staying up uh, so late and entertaining us and um, sharing your, your beautiful data. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone at the next Space Force talk on uh, June 7th. Um, is there anything you want to add, Peter? No, that's um, that's that's great, Paul. You know, June 7th with uh, Gary Nolan, we're going to take a protein perspective at the, the next meeting. Um, and this, this is going to be an awful lot to follow. So, um, but we'll, we'll have to see. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.